Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're grabbing a bunch of secondhand graphics cards and pairing them with the Core i3-8100 to see how they compare to the new Raven Ridge APUs. And as always, we won't be just focusing on performance, but also value. During a time of extreme graphics card prices, the Ryzen 3 2200G and Ryzen 5 2400G offer gamers a very affordable means of building a basic gaming PC. In terms of value, the 2200G has appeared unbeatable in all of our tests so far, but what if you pick up a secondhand graphics card at a great price? Would that be a better option? Well, today I plan to find out. But before we get into it, today's video has been sponsored by Alliance Heroes of the Spire, and this is a must-have mobile game for all you RPG fans. With over 10,000 combinations and 400 unique heroes, Alliance offers ultimate freedom of choice like no other. Not only that, but all the different modes will keep you engaged and entertained. There's a real-time PvP mode, giant bosses to contend with, and of course, massive guild and nation battles. Alliance is also free to play, and if that wasn't sweet enough, download Alliance via the link in the video description and get a bonus 50,000 gold and 50 gems right away. So go check it out, and thank you to Alliance for sponsoring this video. So, for this comparison, we have eight games on the menu, and six secondhand graphics cards covering a range of prices. For the most part, all of the discrete graphics cards have been tested with the Core i3-8100 using 16 gigabytes of DDR4-2400 memory. Then, for comparison, the Raven Ridge APUs have been tested using their Vega 8 and Vega 11 integrated graphics, and they've been paired with 16 gigabytes of DDR4-3200 memory. For the most part, I'm not focusing on overclocking performance, but we will touch on that briefly towards the end of the video, along with a quick look at discrete GPU performance with the 2400G. Testing's been conducted at 1080p and 720p, and yes, budget gamers do often play at this low resolution, and believe it or not, you can still have a whole heap of fun. You'll also have to compromise on image quality settings as well, so I've tested using appropriate quality settings. So, keeping all that in mind, let's jump into the benchmarks. Starting with the 720p results, we see that the 2400G is only able to roughly match the GT1030, which is a current generation entry-level GPU. It's interesting to see that the now 8-year-old flagship GeForce GTX 580 was 13% faster than the 2400G. Of course, it guzzles about 20 times more power, so keep that in mind. The GTX 750 Ti is a standout here, offering 23% more frames on average, and that's a pretty decent performance uplift right there. That said, the R7 370 runs away even further, offering over 40% more frames, while the GTX 760 and HD 7950 were faster again. Before you get too disappointed though, be aware that these older graphics cards aren't cheap, and we'll discuss that more towards the end of the video. Then jumping to 1080p, this really hurts the APUs in Star Wars Battlefront 2. Even with the low quality settings, the game's just too memory intensive and the lack of dedicated VRAM really is a problem here. As a result, the ultra entry level GPUs such as the GT1030 and RX 550 start to pull ahead, well ahead in the case of the RX 550. Meanwhile, the GTX 750 Ti was 35% faster on average and 46% faster when comparing the 1% low data. Moving on, we have CSGO, and this title is as much a CPU test as it is a GPU test, especially at 720p. I suspect those 1% lower results are a limitation of the Ryzen CPU, or the game's ability to properly utilize Ryzen, but we won't get into that. I think it's more of a CPU limitation than it is a Vega GPU limitation. In fact, we do see clear evidence of this when moving to 1080p. Here, the Vega 11 GPU inside the 2400G is now able to match the GT1030. For CSGO players seeking big frame rates, you'll ideally want an Intel quad core, but it has to be said, value for money, the 2200G and 2400G do do very well here, providing a smooth, playable experience. Still, the Core i3-8100 with the old GTX 660 Ti does allow for over 70% more frames on average. Next up, we have Dota 2, and the Raven Ridge APUs are much more competitive here, particularly at 720p. That said, the Core i3-8100 with the GTX 750 Ti was almost 50% faster when comparing the 1% low data, and 65% for the average frame rate. The margins remain much the same at 1080p, and while the experience was still very good with the APUs, it was noticeably smoother with the Core i3-8100 and GTX 750 Ti combo, for example. The R7-370 also allowed for a minimum of 60fps at all times in our test. Fortnite Battle Royale plays very well on the Raven Ridge APUs. At 720p, you can't really complain with the 2400G, 
Though the fact that the R7 370 and GTX 750 Ti are over 40% faster means that you will be able to crank up the visual quality settings and still maintain over 60 FPS at all times. Moving on to 1080p shows how limited the APUs can be in terms of performance and while the 2400G did manage to roughly match the RX 550 and GT 1030, it was world slower than the GTX 750Ti and R7 370. Those particular discrete graphics cards offered 60% more performance which is obviously very significant. Like CSGO, Overwatch is another title that's primarily CPU bound at 720p. However, unlike CSGO, Overwatch does do a good job of utilizing the Ryzen CPUs. As a result, the 2200G and 2400G look very solid, and this time are comparable to not only the RX 550 and GT 1030, but also the HD 7950 and R7 370. Has to be said though that these AMD GPUs do appear to be running into some kind of bottleneck that isn't faced by the GeForce competition. Moving to 1080p sees the R7 370 and HD 7950 pull away, though they still trail the GeForce GPUs by a reasonable margin. The GTX 750 Ti, for example, was faster than the HD 7950 and 41% faster than the 2400G. So while still very playable on the APUs at 1080p, you can get a much better experience with a previous generation budget discrete graphics card. Moving on, now one of the worst experiences had when testing the Raven Ridge APUs for the first time was seen in PUBG. The game was playable at 720p though the 2200G did suffer from stuttering issues at times. That said though in this test we can see that graphics cards such as the GTX 750 Ti were only 19% faster than the 2400G. You really need an R7 370 or a GTX 660 Ti to push past 60fps at all times using these low quality settings. In fact, despite using the low quality preset, PUBG is difficult to run at 1080p and I don't recommend either APU for this task. Based on the data here, you'll ideally want a GTX 760 or HD 7950 for a smooth experience. The second last game tested is Rainbow Six Siege and here the APUs were very competitive. Interestingly, the GTX 580 tanked at 720p, though this is likely down to a driver issue. Meanwhile, the 2400G wasn't a great deal slower than the GTX 750 Ti. The APUs remain competitive at 1080p and the 2400G was able to deliver GTX 750 Ti-like performance. That said, upgrading to the GTX 660 Ti R7370 or even the GTX 760 will net you between 40 to 50% extra performance. Finally, we have Rocket League, and although the APUs managed to maintain over 60 FPS throughout our test, they were significantly slower than almost all the discrete graphics cards tested on the Core i3-8100. This was again the case at 1080p, here the GTX 750 Ti was a whopping 81% faster than the 2400G, while the GTX 760 wasn't that far off being 3 times faster. So while playable in Rocket League, this wasn't a great result for the AMD APUs in terms of cost per frame. Of course, you can overclock these APUs for higher frame rates, but for best results, you will want to spend an additional $10 to $20 on a tower style air cooler. For a quick look at this, I overclocked the GPU in both models to 1.6 GHz and the CPU cores to 3.9 GHz and checked out the performance in Rainbow Six Siege. Here we see that overclocking the 2200G boosts performance by about 20%, and this is enough to place it on par with the stock 2400G. Meanwhile, we could only improve the 2400G's performance by about 8%, though in this test that was enough to place it ahead of the GTX 750Ti and RX 550. Of course, while you can't overclock the Core i3-8100, you can overclock all of these graphics cards to receive at least 10% more performance, so it's somewhat of a moot point. Finally, I just wanted to take a quick look at how the Radeon HD 7950 performs on the Ryzen 5 2400G compared to the Core i3-8100. I will look at this in much more detail in a future video, but for now this should give us some idea of what to expect. Here we see in Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p using the low quality preset, the Core i3-8100 is 17% faster than the 2400G when comparing the 1% low data. That's a pretty significant advantage, and while we might not see this in all titles, it means for gaming with a discrete graphics card the Coffee Lake CPUs can at times enable much greater performance despite using much slower DDR4 memory. Okay, so that uh, didn't look particularly good to be honest. It has to be said though that virtually all of the discrete graphics cards featured in this comparison are very good.
Well, most gamers might scoff at a GTX 750 Ti in 2018, but it does still pack 640 CUDA cores in a 148mm square die, and with 2GB of dedicated GDDR5 memory on a 192-bit wide bus, it enjoys a bandwidth of 88GB per second. My point is no integrated GPU that's existed ever has been able to hold a candle to something like that and while you could argue that neither can the Raven Ridge APUs, they do do significantly better than anything that's come before them. And here's a quick look at the 8 game breakdown using the 1080p data. Across the 8 games tested, the GTX 750 Ti was on average 38% faster than the 2400G and 60% faster than the 2200G, so that's a bit brutal to be honest. It also gets quite a bit worse when you look at the R7 370, GTX 660 Ti, and so on. So we know that the 2200G with its CPU and GPU combo costs just $100 US, and the 2400G $170 US. But how much do these older graphics cards cost on the second-hand market? Well, this is a bit of a difficult question to address because pricing in the used market varies quite a bit. As is the case with new graphics cards, pricing from just a few months ago is completely irrelevant today. For example, you managed to get a GTX 750 Ti for $30 three months ago, and well, that's a great price. Getting one for that price today, though, might not be possible, especially depending on where you're situated in the world, but in any case, it's still going to be mighty difficult. Hopping over to ebay.com and pulling up all the completed listings so far this month, we see that the average selling price for a GTX 750 Ti was $68 US. That then is about what you could expect to pay for one. Of course, you might get lucky and get one for $40, or you might get unlucky, not do your research, and get rolled for, say, $90. You might also, of course, get rolled paying just $40. The card could rock up and be dead on arrival, and then you have to deal with all that, and that's just the fun of secondhand shopping. Anyway, all that aside, I've gone and worked out the average selling price for all the used graphics cards featured in this video, and done a cost per frame analysis. This then is what we're looking at, and it places the APUs in rather poor light. However, we are missing a key ingredient the CPU. While the 2200G with its Ryzen CPU cores and Vega 8 GPU costs just $100 US, the R7370 or the GTX 750 Ti or any other discrete graphics card featured in this video aren't much good without a CPU. For testing, I used the Core i3-8100, and that costs $115 US, so that value really needs to be added to the GPU cost. So adding in the Core i3-8100 price, let's see how the graph looks now. Okay, so that looks much better for the APUs. The 2200G in particular is very competitive, but you'll have no doubt noticed that it's still not the best value option. The Core i3-8100 paired with the GTX 760 was about 10% better in terms of value, despite costing twice as much. The GTX 580 is also slightly better as well, though that particular graphics card does consume copious amounts of power, making it a very hot item. Basically though, what this is showing us is that in terms of value, the 2200G is excellent, especially when compared to brand new hardware. The 2400G is still a decent option, but for budget shoppers, it's far less attractive and it's not terribly difficult to get a better deal shopping secondhand. And all this pretty much falls in line with what I said in our day one Raven Ridge coverage. That said though, this still isn't the full story. Both the Core i3-8100 and Raven Ridge APUs will require a new motherboard and DDR4 memory. If you already have a B350 motherboard, you probably aren't upgrading to an APU, so that scenario doesn't really make sense. Chances are if you're getting an APU, you do need to buy a new motherboard. So if we factor in the motherboard and memory prices, things do change quite a bit. This next graph adds $70 to all the configurations for a B350 or a B360 motherboard. I expect that those will be out quite soon. And then $85 for eight gigabytes of DDR4 2400 memory, and that is for the Core i3 configurations, which are all the discrete graphics cards. And then $105 for DDR4 3200 memory for the APUs. The total platform cost for each configuration is listed in the following graph. And like that, the APUs look a lot less attractive. Once you factor in the entire platform cost, they're actually considerably poorer value when compared to the Core i3-8100 with a secondhand GPU. As I noted in my day one review, they are better value than the Core i3 with a new graphics card, but the secondhand stuff gives this combo the edge. 
It's also interesting to note that while the 2200G was 32% cheaper than the 2400G when comparing just the price of the APUs, the 2200G is just 8% cheaper when comparing the entire platform cost. Okay, so how useful these new AMD APUs really are depends on your needs and how you go about upgrading or building your new system. If you're building a brand new PC from the ground up and you're confident you can get a decent graphics card on the second hand market, then you're probably best off with the Core i3-8100 for example. The Core i3-8100 and GeForce GTX 760 for example might cost twice as much as the 2200G. But once you factor in the price of the motherboard and the memory modules, that $100 difference over the 2200G becomes a lot less significant. In fact, that combo costs just 30% more now once you factor in those additional components. Then if you will also factor in the cost of a case, power supply and all the other stuff, then the margin just continues to shrink and it becomes very insignificant at that point. So at this point, you might be wondering why I recommend AMD APUs at all? Well, compared to other new hardware options, they are actually very cost effective. Not everyone can or wants to buy secondhand hardware, and there are obvious pitfalls to doing so. For those content with a low-end gaming solution, but would like a platform they can build upon for years to come, the 2200G is a unique choice. Get yourself a decent B350 motherboard, some DDR4 memory, and in a year or two, you could be rocking an affordable 8-core 16-thread CPU. The 2400G isn't quite as attractive, but with 4 cores and 8 threads, it is a very solid gaming choice, and it will be for years to come, and it offers excellent frame time performance. Uh, drop in a mid-range or high-end graphics card down the track, and you're good to go. Of course, it all gets more complicated when you introduce other CPUs. For example, you can purchase the Pentium G4560 with a H110 motherboard plus a second-hand GeForce GTX 760 graphics card for about the same price as the 2200G combo, and in most games, it will be a lot faster. For non-gaming tasks though, the 2200G is a much more powerful CPU, and for the G4560 to really make sense, you have to rely on getting a good second-hand graphics card for the right price. With almost limitless options, I'm going to end this video here before I continue to just go on and on. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content, and if you appreciate the testing we do here at Harbour Unboxed, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching, I'm your host Steve, see you again next time.